Good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you have taken sufficient uh, stock of the back table. Good cheese and wine. Uh, feel free to bring a bottle to your table. Um, I don't want to see any empty, or any full wine by the end of the evening. Uh, again, thank you for coming. My name is Ari Wallach. Uh, the panel that you are at, so you know you're in the right room, is the future of war and armed conflict, how technological change is altering the nature of conflict in the 21st century. Uh, the, the way we're going to run this, just so you know, is just a couple of brief remarks. Um, well, first, I'm going to introduce everyone. They're going to do a couple of brief remarks down the table, and we're going to open this up for basically, I'm going to be doing very, very, very light moderating, if you will. Um, mostly, there'll be conversation within the group. We are also live streaming online right now. Um, we're using the hashtag FutureWarSIPA, so we're also taking in questions through Twitter right now as well. Um, and those will be, you'll see those being handed to me as we go through. Also, there are no cards at your table, um, so that we can kind of keep the conversation flow going. The way we're going to do this is just kind of write out your questions. Uh, they'll be brought to me. I'll kind of go through them. Because sometimes we have four people asking kind of a similar question, so I'll amalgamate them and make sure uh, it goes to the group. So I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, Dean Merritt Janow at the School of International and Public Affairs and Richard Betts and Ingrid Gertzman of SIPA's Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies for organizing the panel discussion tonight. Uh, this evening, like I said, we'll be live streaming via the SIPA website, but it'll also be archived for later viewing by my mother. Um, or anyone else who chooses to do it, but probably mostly my mom. Um, so there's bios in here. They're, they're long and they're lengthy, but what I'm just going to kind of do is uh, give you a, a brief snapshot. This is a, a great crew. I, I know most of the people here are honored to know some of them for a long time and some of them are kind of just getting to connect. Um, so the, the, the first person I want to introduce is Shane Harris. Uh, he's the author and journalist who has written extensively about intelligence and national security. His new book, At War, The Rise of the Military Internet Complex, explores the front lines of America's new cyber war. He's kind of appeared everywhere lately. He's New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and others. So with that, I'm going to let Shane kind of give us some remarks, and we'll just keep going. Okay, okay good. Uh, well, thank you for coming. So I'll try and sort of kick things off with some, uh, some thoughts. Largely, I'll, I'll stick to what's in my book, At War, uh, which is uh, certainly the future of war and armed conflict is, is embedded in that as well. Um, the book really is about, and a lot of what my research and my reporting has been about for the past several years, of how it is that cyber warfare to include uh, foreign governments hacking into our companies, stealing information, trying to find ways to potentially damage physical infrastructure like power plants uh, and public utilities, how that became sort of a preoccupation, uh, a top of mind issue for national security officials in Washington. Uh, and, and really what the book does is tries to go through and chart over the past seven or eight years how consecutively through a series of events, including some pretty big uh, uh, hacks into US companies and theft of defense information, as well as some very aggressive and ambitious offensive cyber attacks on our part, uh, including against the government of Iran and its nuclear weapons program, uh, and also in Iraq, which maybe we can talk about later, kind of became, it turned cyberspace for the military into what they call a battlefield or a fifth domain of warfare. Um, you hear U.S. military officials describing it that way a lot lately, after air, land, sea, and outer space. Uh, and the military and the intelligence community, and principally the National Security Agency, which I write a lot about and has been in the news for the past couple of years, are really beginning to view cyberspace, or what we would call the internet, or the internet of things even more, uh, as a place to gain strategic advantage over our adversaries and a place where we are also vulnerable to attack. Um, you probably have just heard in the past couple of hours a series of French television stations were knocked offline, apparently, completely by a group calling itself the Cyber Caliphate. Uh, we've had examples of North Korea hacking Sony, other very high-profile breaches. It seems like every day you're basically hearing about another incident involving higher and higher stakes and consequences. Uh, in cyberspace. None of this is new to people in the national security community. And the book and a lot of my search, research has been aimed at telling that story uh, of how it is that this became such a preoccupying issue for national security officials that actually they view it, I think, as a greater risk even than domestic terrorism right now. Uh, 
next up is Yasmin Green. Um, she's the head of strategy and operations for Google Ideas. She also oversees the team's work on counter-radicalization and fragile states. She recently led a multi-partner coalition to launch against launch against violent extremism, the world's first online network of former violent extremists and survivors of terrorism. Uh, last year, I uh, met, as part of my work with Google Ideas, uh, an influential Tunisian blogger and internet freedom activist called Slim Amami. Um Slim had been arrested a bunch of times by the Tunisian government, uh, most recently for organizing street protests as part of Tunisia's Jasmine Revolution. Um, the interesting thing about the last time he was arrested was that two days after he was released, he went from being treated as a criminal to being appointed Secretary of State for Youth and Sport in the new post-Arab Spring Tunisian government, which is really remarkable, but it's actually sad because within four months of his appointment, he resigned in protest of what he said was a return to uh, censorship in Tunisia. But there's one thing that Slim said that stuck with me in particular. He said, if you're not tech savvy, you're not effective because you're not safe. Right now, there are three billion people in the world who have access to the internet. In the next decade, that number will more than double. But if we look at the world in which they're coming online, it's a bit problematic. So conflict's widespread. There are 50 to 60 ongoing conflicts in the world that result in violence. Repression persists. According to research and advocacy NGO Freedom House, two out of every three people in the world faces some type of repression. Uh, and religious tensions are high. Pew Research Center says that 77% of the world's population live in countries where there are restrictions on religious freedom. So not to trivialize them, but repression and conflict are not new phenomena. What is new is the internet revolution. And uh, there's a real risk that as these next three billion people come online, they won't just be facing threats around conflict and instability in the physical world. They will actually be facing threats uh, that are manifesting themselves in entirely new ways on the internet. So let's take, for example, uh, people in places like Iran and Syria. There, people are persecuted for belonging to ethnic minorities, religious minorities, for their sexual preferences, and maybe just for having independent thought. They're tortured for their internet passwords and imprisoned. Their families might be hacked or harassed. And when we think about digital repression, it, it's pretty easy for us to underestimate the severity of those threats. But in fact, they are very severe. And that nexus between geopolitics and technology is where Google Ideas takes its starting point. And just out of curiosity, other than the, the two people from Google Ideas in the audience, how many people here have, have heard of Google Ideas before, by show of hands? Wow, ah, that's great, so more than half. Um, Google Ideas is, is Google's think slash do tank. Um, we are focused on a particular category of user that's having a very difficult time, um, living in places of conflict and instability. Um, and uh, like a, you know, kind of like a think tank would operate within a technology revolution, we convene, but when we convene, it's political scientists alongside computer scientists and people with unique lived experience of these issues. And our outputs, rather than, say, policy recommendations, are more likely to be technologies that actually protect and empower the next three billion people coming online. And actually, I'd be curious if any of the people here in the room or um, live streaming have ideas of technologies that could help people in repressive countries. So the internet revolution certainly has changes the way that we all interact with each other. Um, and in general, that leads to wildly positive benefits, be they in entertainment, communication, commerce. Uh, but there are threats associated with that, which we're going to discuss today. And as Slim Amamu, the Tunisian blogger and activist, and no longer Secretary of State, um, from Tunisia warned, individuals and states and NGOs alike are going to have to be tech savvy uh, to operate in the new digital reality. Sorry. Uh, so the ne next person is, is an old dear friend, Alec Ross, who is, is currently a senior fellow at SIPA. Uh, he's one of America's leading experts on innovation, and he recently served for four years as a senior advisor for senior innovation, uh, a senior advisor for innovation to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton 
where he acted as the diplomatic lead on a range of issues, including cybersecurity, internet freedom, disaster response, and the use of network technologies in conflict zones. Exactly, Alex. Thank you, Ori. I want to speak at the intersection of the remarks made by Yasmin and by Shane. Uh, if you deconstruct today's attack in France today by the so-called uh, cyber caliphate, what they took, what it appears they did is they, they disrupted the transmissions from 11 different television stations, including TV5 and other, bi and other big uh, French television stations, as well as got inside their email systems, hijacked their social media sites and other such things. As I think about this, one of the things that's really interesting to me is, first of all, let's define the aggressor here the cyber caliphate. It is a group of hackers that may or may not be physically domiciled inside something, inside a, a space physically controlled by the Islamic State. The Islamic State, depending on your point of view, may or may not actually be a state. So it's sort of a likely a, a confederation of hackers working geographically away from a quasi-state-based entity attacking a series of private entities as a way of demonstrating the anger, sort of the fist-waving anger of Islamists against France, largely uh, rooted in the, the, in the response to the Charlie Hebdo attack. France has been, France has been the uh, target of 19,000 cyber attacks uh, since, since Charlie Hebdo attack. And the interesting thing to me about this in part is after these private concerns, these television stations were attacked, they all turned to the French government and effectively said, what are you going to do? And the French government is now sort of cobbling up a response to all of this. And so what's interesting to me to see is that while there have often, while throughout history there have been private sector approaches to warfare, whether it was through mercenaries, privateers, this, that, or anything else, as we do move into this new domain of warfare, and while I was in government, we did formally classify cyber as a new domain of warfare, where we have the legal rights to engage offensively and defensively uh, as we do in air, land, sea, and space. What's interesting about this is that unlike traditional warfare, these tend not to be conflicts between, from country to country sovereign nation state versus sovereign nation state, though that does occasionally happen. And it happened in recent days when, the, when uh, hackers undeniably affiliated s in some way with the Russian government cyber attacked uh, certain United States government websites and, and internet properties. But I think we're going to increasingly see conflict in the technological domain, initially in cyber, but also perhaps moving into drones and into other forms of technological warfare, where conflict will not just be country versus country, but country versus company, company versus country, company versus company. And so t t thinking about Yasmin's remarks and her role at Google, I remember when Eric Schmidt, the then CEO of Google, came to the State Department in December of 2010 to brief me and some colleagues from government that Google had been, had been cyber attacked inside China along with 30 some other companies. And what was interesting was that all of these were fairly large companies, you know, Raytheon, Boeing, large industrial companies, fairly sophisticated, used to engaging with government and other such things. And the thing they all agreed to do was, you know, talk to the United States government and we'll work our way through this through diplomatic, through dominantly through diplomatic channels. But I asked myself then, what would have happened if instead of the CEO of Google sort of going to Washington, what if the vice president of engineer, the vice president of engineering had said, all right, we see who's attacking us, let's attack them. And so what, what, I, what I'm continuing to think about is the private sector, not just on the defensive side of some of these things, but potentially on the offensive side of some of these things. And it's really going to, shift the nature of warfare conflict in, in some ways that I think are really interesting. Uh, next up is also an old dear friend, Matthew Waxman, who's the Lubrescu Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. He's an expert in national security law and international law, 
including issues related to executive power, international human rights, and constitutional rights, military force, and armed conflict and terrorism. You basically cover everything except for like bankruptcy, right? Um, before joining the Columbia faculty, Waxman served in senior positions at the US State Department, the Department of Defense, and the National Security Council. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, we've heard already, and I, and I agree, uh, that many new technologies or sets of technologies will impact uh, uh, the future of, of warfare, the future of, of conflict. We've talked especially about cyber uh, technologies, but I'd also include things like robotics, uh, uh, machine learning. Uh, uh, undoubtedly, they will impact uh, in significant ways the way that uh, uh, conflict is, is waged, the way that we and, and others engage in the types of conflicts uh, and, and the way that they're waged. One of the sets of issues that I think about and, and, and write and, and teach on is, is how some of these changes uh, will or, or will not affect uh, changes in law and ethics. Uh, in, in, in brief, can law and ethics keep up with these changes in technology. Um, one reason to be concerned is uh, technology is changing faster and faster, but law tends to evolve very, very slowly. Uh, uh, so will, will, will law be able to keep up with changes in technology? Uh, I, I do want to, though, just put out a, a, a bit of a, of a cautionary note based on, on history. And that is uh, to say that w w while I agree with everybody here uh, that these, these various kinds of technologies will transform warfare, transform conflict in some significant ways. Um, I think it's extremely difficult to predict with great confidence how transformative they'll be. Um, and I, you know, for just I, I think history can be instructive there. Uh, you know, it was widely assumed in the 1920s and the 1930s that the advent of air power would revolutionize industrial age warfare. Um, some thought that the bombing of cities would cause very rapid social disruption. Uh, uh, this influenced especially British bombing policy in, in World War II. Um, that actually turned out to be, to be wrong. Some thought that uh, you would be able to knock out key nodes uh, supporting industrial war economies uh, and that this would quickly bring production to a halt. Uh, and, this, and this greatly influenced um, US uh, bombing policy in World War II. That also proved to be wrong. Uh, uh, neither, neither proved to be right. It, uh, air power was radically transformative, in, among other things, in uh, the kind of civilian destruction that was, uh, that, that was brought out, uh, that, was, uh, that, that was wrought by it, uh, but not with the effects that were predicted by a lot of theorists who predicted the, these effects very, very confidently. Um, so for me, one of the lessons of history is um, to be quite cautious about bold predictions when it comes to exactly how new technologies will impact the future of conflict. Thank you. Um, so again, I'm Ari Wallach. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company here in New York City called Synthesis Corp. We're a strategic consultancy. We work with the United Nations, the State Department, other government agencies and corporations, basically helping them to think about the future and how they position themselves literally from a, from a business model to, to not only kind of take advantage, but, but thrive in the new future or new futures that are coming. Um, and I'm also, I should note, adjunct professor here at the great SIPA. Um, before I, I, I take my seat to kind of join this, I'm gonna go right back to you, Matt. The, the, the question that I've heard from a couple of people already kind of online is, what about like the Geneva Conventions? Like a, a lot of the laws that are in place right now, so before we go into the robotics and the AI and, every, and everything else, just from, from, a, from a legal framework, I mean, we have North Korea and Sony. We have certain nation states and Stuxnet, right? We have what happened today in France, these kind of countries to, to like Alex said, to the pri like, what are the ramifications, like, who do you go after, right, in these kind of situations, just even from a legal standpoint? Sure, I mean, it certainly is true that, uh, I the, the body of law that we have, the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law regulating conduct in, in warfare um, was built for a, a previous age. And one of the challenges is how do you either update or translate that body of law to deal with new forms of conflict 
uh, uh, and new technologies of conflict, new forms of technology, uh, new new forms of conflict, uh, uh, for reasons that Alec referred to earlier. Uh, uh, not the rise of non-state actors. Let's say uh, 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 it is now possible that networks of individuals can wield violence on a global scale at a level of sophistication and intensity previously only achievable by, by states. Uh, but I, 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 law was mostly built to deal with state versus state warfare and I, 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 uh, military versus military encounters in geographically contained places. Now, I, I think one of the big debates then is whether uh, law need, does in fact need to be updated in some radical way, um, or whether law can more incrementally be adjusted and adapted to deal with these new technologies. I tend to put myself more in that latter camp. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm more hopeful, I, I don't think it will be easy to translate existing law to deal with these new technologies, but I do think it's possible and it's probably our best bet for dealing with a lot of uh, a, a lot of these problems, and that is because the law and and ethics, ethical norms of of conflict, most most of it uh, reduces to some core principles about which there is a lot of uh, a, a, a great deal of consensus. Uh, uh, principles like uh, that of distinction uh, that you. I, 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 I are obligated to refrain from intentionally attacking civilians, to attack only legitimate military targets. Proportionality, the idea that um, you should not launch attacks where the expected civilian collateral damage is excessive in relation to the expected military gain. Now, what these terms mean, the numerator and the denominator of that formula mean in some of these new contexts is often going to be difficult. Um, but, but again, to return to my earlier point, that's, that's long been the case in warfare. Um, I, 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 when, when you look again at the history of, of aerial warfare and, and, and aerial bombardment, it has long been the case, there have there's long been debates about whether you can attack uh, uh, a munitions factory. And if you can attack a munitions factory, can you attack munitions workers or the, the materials uh, that are necessary in order to build munitions? Uh, so line drawing becomes challenging when you're talking about new technologies, new uh, 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 means of warfare. Um, but I think it's, it's possible to reason these things through, and I think it's a long-standing challenge of the law. Okay, actually jump in with a, <clears throat> there's an anecdote from sort of very recent history that sort of gets at some of these, these, these complex issues, and I think it suggests actually a potentially hopeful answer to that question, but also points out some potential pitfalls. So in November, the Sony Corporation discovered that it had been penetrated by hackers who had stolen some of its intellectual property, namely emails, you know, catty comments about Angelina Jolie and the like. Um, but also had destroyed data and actually destroyed some of the computers, rendered them useless, and then, of course, threats emerged against the company for showing the movie The Interview. Um, <clears throat> I think you're all pretty familiar with what, what happened. Quickly, it, it came about that North Korea was suspected of being behind uh, this intrusion, this hack, attack, if you want to call it that. Um, from sources I've talked to about this, within the White House, the immediate question wasn't, can we attribute this to North Korea? The intelligence community actually thought they had very compelling evidence that it was, in fact, the North Koreans who were responsible for this. The question was, what are we going to do about that, particularly if senior officials go out and publicly say that North Korea was behind this? There's going to have to be some kind of a response. We can't just say they did it and back down, although we probably could, considering we say that China does a lot of bad things and we don't do much about that either. But the pressure was really building, and I think maybe the White House even saw an opportunity here. And so on December 19th, the president came out in his last press conference of the year and said definitively North Korea was responsible for this. He condemned it as an assault on our freedom of speech and our constitutional values. And then he said something very interesting, which goes to what Matt's talking about, that we will execute a, quote, proportional response at a time of our choosing, which is, again, it's, a, it's trying to adapt the language of the law of armed conflict to cyberspace. And the question became, well, what is a proportional response? What does that look like? And the answer, ultimately, from, from my reporting, I discovered, was we did launch some targeted attacks on infrastructure, internet infrastructure in North Korea to send a message, to, to meddle with them. Uh, a couple of days after Obama's speech, the internet suddenly went down in North Korea, uh, completely offline, which is actually not a hard trick to pull off because there's only about four connections to the outside world and they all run through China. 
Um, sources tell me that we were not responsible for that. Still unclear who did it. But then we levied sanctions. Uh, uh, you know, sanctions against uh, North Korea's leading arms manufacturer, against some individuals in the country. So they were sort of working through, kind of out loud, almost improvisationally, I think, what the response would be to an event like this. The sort of pitfall is what would happen if Sony decided that it wanted to respond to this as well. I mean, under US law right now, they could not hack back against the people who hit them. But what happens when they come at them again? You know, the government did not provide any defense for Sony. It just did a, a policy response of its own. Um, I think this gets at exactly what, what Alec was saying, is that we're entering into a conflict here where it is not reasonable to just presume that the only interested parties in responding to such an event will be state actors. You know, there are companies who are losing money, who are having their reputations damaged, who have a very keen interest in not just possibly retaliating, but in stopping this from happening again. And we should remember this was not the first time that Sony had been hacked. They were actually hacked two years ago. Um, so that's it's, it's potentially something that is on their minds as well. Let me uh, pivot things now to the questions from all of you. As a reminder, there are these no cards on your table. And if you get an idea for a question, please hold it up and, and Kate will come retrieve it. We already have a number of them and they're all very good. So what I hope we can do is get through all of these if we can. Um, let me just flag uh, Yasmin and Ari if you could if, if I could ask the two of you to respond to this question, obviously, Matt and Shane, if you'd like to add something, please do. But uh, the question is, what do these changes in war warfare mean for the individuals? How does one protect themselves from the intrusive government investigations? It says, e.g., Israeli customs officers randomly picking people up uh, at the border and demanding passwords to emails. Security in conflict, uh, security is in conflict with personal privacy. What should individuals do? Yasmin, can we start with you and go to Ari? Yeah, I think that's a, a fantastic question. It, it's kind of like a, um, it's like there's a, there's a physical world analogy in terms of the responsibility for internet companies to help protect you and the responsibility that individuals have to help protect themselves. So when you buy um, a new home, it has um, locks on the door and it has a carbon monoxide detector, but you still have the responsibility to keep your key safe and not to leave the gas cooker on overnight. Um, and I think that there is always a two-pronged approach to protection, whether we speak about um, threats of surveillance or unauthorized access to your information as it's traveling around the internet, or um, malware and phishing, which we can talk about, which are kind of threats to your password and, and your uh, personal uh, information that you have might have on your accounts. Um, Google, for example, um, I can talk to our efforts. So we um, encrypt our products. That means that when you use Gmail or Google Search or Google Maps, um, that connection is encrypted. So if somebody like a repressive government or, or a um, a corrupt ISP is just ta tapping into the wire to see what you're doing or maybe to even tamper with your information, they can't because uh, that information is encrypted. They can't see what's there. Um, but you, you know, there are tools that individuals can use to give themselves an extra layer of protection. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting, and I think the question kind of um, hints at this. The, the same technologies that protect you, your online privacy and security, are the, the technologies that protect you from widespread surveillance um, and censorship. So um, one, one product where Google Ideas actually did research that read, led to the development of this um, is a product called Uproxy, which is, uh, allows somebody in a repressive, a non-repressive country to give internet access in a secure way to somebody who lives in a repressive country. And it works by uh, allowing both sides to download a Chrome extension, so software associated with our uh, browser called Chrome, um, and through those, that connection, um, they can share their internet access. Tangibly, that means that my cousin who lives in Iran, who has all of uh, the, f the platforms like YouTube, Facebook blocked, um, and is, is frequently subject to surveillance and, and um, manipulation of his traffic, he can use this Chrome extension to get my internet access that I have here in New York, which is fairly free. Um, and he can do that in a secure way. He can get my internet access in a, you know, from me, who he knows and trusts. And interestingly, I can get internet access through him in Tehran if I wanted to know what the repressive internet he's experiencing looks like. So those are just some ideas of, of, of examples, sorry, of things that companies do for you, but also things that you can do for yourself. 
Um, interestingly, the use of proxies is so widespread that um, some really notable people in Iran use them. And Iran, is, which is where I'm from, is um, a very repressive country. Freedom House ranked it 191 out of 197 countries in terms of press freedom. So it's sixth from the bottom, very repressive, and it has a large online population, 52%. Um, so this is a country that really experiments a lot with, with digital repression. Um, a lot of websites are blocked and intercepted, throttled. Um, yet some notable users of proxies in Iran are uh, the foreign minister, Javad Zarif, who uses a proxy to, uh, to deliver updates on the nuclear negotiations to his Facebook page, which has 800,000 uh, likes. Um, the president, Rouhani, who has a Twitter page, he tweets all the time to 325,000 Twitter followers. There's no way that they can be using these social media platforms if they themselves do not use proxies um, to protect themselves against their own digital repression. And the final one is um, the supreme leader of Iran um, who constantly gives me updates on his whereabouts and what he's up to through my Instagram feed. So um, it's pretty interesting the kind of hypocrisy that we're seeing um, in countries like Iran. Proxies funded by the State Department. Not you proxy, but yeah, there are there are uh, proxies. there are a lot the of proxies, proxies they use. I think um, I think I don't know if how many people here have used a, a proxy before. Maybe we could have a show of hands. Okay, more than half. Um, I, a, lo a lot of you are probably using vir VPNs, virtual private networks. And um, the fact is that the use of wi uh, proxies isn't as widespread as it should be because they're not um, they're not proven to be consistently safe enough or or easy to use. Like I don't I would love my parents to use. You proxy or um, a proxy, and at the moment they don't. So I think we've got a way to go to, to make tools really obvious to use and, and easy so that everyone will be helping protect themselves. So I, I've been thinking a lot about this actually lately. Um, when, when I look at a lot of kind of cybersecurity firms like Symantec or Mandiant or McAfee, um, what, I, what, I, what I realized not that long ago, and it's actually pretty obvious when you hear it, is they're all based on platform security. So maybe your iPad or your computer or maybe even your phone. And what occurred to me is we're very much moving into a time now where our, our cybersecurity has to be less about the platform and more about the person. And so what I mean by that is that, and, and, and what you're talking about, the, the proxy goes to it, the VPN, also people using the Tor network as well, that what I, the, the shift that I, that I see that's gonna start happening is that we're gonna see the kind of the rise of antivirus and anti-malware, but again, it won't be something that you subscribe to for your machine, but it'll be what you subscribe to as an individual. Um, and so that means that the idea, it'll, it'll wrap around everything you do. Now, what, what that basically means is you'll have a firewall around you as an individual. Um, where, because where this starts to get interesting, and this was alluded to in some of the comments, is around Internet of Things, is, a, is around wearables, is around tracking. So anyone who uses Google Maps or Waze, who's always giving your position, right? And part of that is you're crowdsourcing where you are because you benefit from, because you're telling Waze or Google you're stuck in traffic, you also benefit from that because other people are giving up that information as well. Um, but that being said, you're still geolocating yourself. And this, uh, you know, where we see is really interesting is also on geo-targeted ads. So we've worked with companies now who will sell mobile ads to people, but only when they're on a certain bus line because they know how fast they're going at their stop and starting, and they know the demographic they want to talk to rides the bus only on certain lines, right? So it sounds great from a marketing perspective, but what ends up happening is individuals start to lose that, that sense of privacy of who they are. That's just on the, on the marketing side. It gets much more nefarious when you go into, into certain regimes. So I, I do think, Alec, there will be a rise of this kind of uh, collective security around you that is everything that you touch. And, and, the, and the second part is, on the example that's used, is it's, it's, who you are is no longer just on the platforms, but it's very much on the cloud. So the question, and this was one that goes in some ways back to Matt and kind of search and seizure, is like, what is the, the legal ramifications of searching someone where the information that you want is not actually in the geographic territory that you have power over the individual? And this could basically be for anyone who has anything on the cloud because most things, a lot of things are obviously stored in the US, but now we're using server farms and they're virtualized across the world and we're the ability for governments and lawful ways to access when that data actually doesn't sit within their sovereign rights. So 
question, a comment and a question was there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me remind everybody that we are also taking questions on Twitter. The hashtag is FutureWarSIPA, S-I-P-A. Uh, let me go to the next question, and I'm going to answer it. <laughs> and then anybody else who wants to jump in ought to. It, it, the question is, and it's my, my answer is, to this is one that gets me in trouble with a lot of sort of my lefty techno hipster friends. We recently saw this week a guerrilla type action in Brooklyn displaying a statue to Edward Snowden. What is the panel's take on Snowden's revelations? So let me respond first and say that I think it's really important to distinguish between Snowden and Snowden's revelations. And let me describe why I think the distinction is important. I think that Snowden's revelations uh, began a very important dialogue, uh, brought the public to a discussion that the public had been shielded from. I think it revealed a failure of oversight, a failure of executive oversight, a failure of legislative oversight, and a failure of judicial oversight. I think it led to an important presidential review, and I hope that the president fully enacts all of the recommendations of his review panel. I think that it demonstrated that the NSA had clearly gone beyond, gone beyond uh, the scope of their authority and what's reasonable. Uh, so I think it, it produced some important outcomes. Having said that, I don't agree with what Edward Snowden did at all. Um, it's because of, and it's because of how he did it. Uh, it was completely unnecessary for him to go to Hong Kong and then to Moscow and to work through uh, journalists as a way of getting this content out there. As somebody who worked in the intelligence community, his ability to uh, share this information with congressional oversight, the inspector general's office inside the NSA, I mean, there are abundant opportunities uh, to share this information in a way that you wouldn't be putting this in the hands of the Russian government and the Chinese government. And I, I think that anybody who thinks it's a coincidence that he ended up in Hong Kong and Moscow is smoking crack. I mean, give me a break. There are a lot more non-extradition countries uh, that would have protected Edward Snowden that have much nicer winners than Moscow. And Hong Kong is not exactly a bastion of internet freedom. So I think that his, I think that his movements after leaving uh, the NSA were clearly facilitated by the interests of both China and Russia. I think in so doing, I think it's very reasonable to question whether he's guilty of treason. I hope he does uh, take advantage of the opportunity to come to the United States and test uh, the rule of law in this country and let a jury of his peers determine whether he is guilty or not. And so, but then let me go back to what I said at the beginning, which is that what he revealed is very important and we are better as a society for, having, for it having come out. But there was a, re, there was a real failure on his part uh, in terms of how he did it that I think undermined, uh, it, it undermined the United States' standing and it undermined our national security interests in a very significant way. And it empowered Russia and China in ways that I don't think any of my lefty techno hipster friends would care to admit to or like. So I think it's very important to make a distinction between what the Snowden revelations revealed and what and um, what Snowden's specific choices of actions were. Um, Alex's comment or his assessment of Snowden reminds me of a quote, and I do not remember who said it about what to do with people who leak information of this scale, which was give them a medal and throw them in jail. Um, and that's frankly how I think a lot of people in the intelligence community who I talk to, you know, as Alec is saying, you know, have very mixed feelings about Snowden because on the one hand, there is this sort of sense, even among people who are strong critics of his, that he did in fact ignite a policy debate that journalists had been unable to do uh, you know, including those of us who had been writing about many of these programs without knowing what their, you know, internal code names were or having PowerPoint slides. Um, uh, I, I think that, you know, the, just putting on my journalist hat here for a second, because so much of the talk about Snowden, how we think of him, has obviously been filtered through the lens of the journalism that he enabled. 
uh, um, the former editor of the, New York, of the New York Times had a great assessment of him. And she said, um, he's neither a, a, I don't see him as a hero or a traitor, I see him as a very good source. Uh, and for journalists, it's kind of easy for us to be dispassionate about that. Um, as time has gone on, it's, it's become less and less easy. Um, and, as, and as we learn more about him, and, and the positions have been more nuanced. But just a couple of observations on Snowden. Um, had he only revealed one or two programs, including maybe some of the most serious programs, like the collection of telephone metadata, for instance, the so-called 215 program, um, which is going to be up for renewal in July, or sorry, June. Um, I think had he just revealed that one program or a couple of programs, maybe about the way that the government was taking information from companies' data centers or some of these more controversial things, then he would have been, I think, less of an ambiguous character. I think poor pe people would have probably said, well, yes, maybe what he did was even illegal. Maybe he could have gone through other channels. But fundamentally, you know, we are having a good debate. The, the problem in, in why Snowden's leaks be, are so characteristically different than anything that's happened before really is the volume of information that he disclosed. And we're only really seeing a fraction of it. I mean, the stories that you've seen in the press, it seems like a lot. There is a lot more information, trust me, that's in those files. Much of it which has been seen by journalists who have chosen not to report on it because they, w they believe that it would be too dangerous to disclose some of it. So we're going to keep having this Snowden debate for a long time, right? It's not going to be settled. And I think as time goes on, we're going to probably find that Washington is going to you know, pretty much settle on how it feels about surveillance. I don't think that the president's going to implement hardly any of the re review panel recommendations. It's not even clear that Congress is going to reauthorize the 215 program. Washington is almost sort of moving on from this, but there's still, you know, a lot of questions and a lot of discussion, I think, to be had about what motivated Snowden to do what he did, you know, what is the long-term damage, what is the long-term help. Um, I think it's a very hard question still to answer, frankly, and we're just sort of kind of in the beginning of, of really assessing that long term. If you talk to people in the intelligence community, I mean, the view is, is pretty uniformly negative. Um, and obviously, that, that reveals um, their own biases. But you know, just speaking as a journalist, um, yes, I'm glad it happened. I mean, it it, in the aggregate, I think it was good. And it started a debate that, you know, frankly, none of us were able to do. Maybe just to contribute a few more um, perspectives. From Google's perspective, uh, the encryption that I spoke about was already happening, but certainly after the Snowden revelations, we doubled down and um, made sure to encrypt more and encrypt faster, which uh, protects users' privacy and security online, which is a plus for users. Um, an interesting anecdote, though, from a, a friend who, visited, who participated in a conference in the Middle East that was focused on uh, surveillance and intelligence gathering. Um, capabilities. So the, there were vendors at this conference that were trying to sell largely to law enforcement the abilities to surveil um, and, and censor their populations. And what she reported back is that largely um, the Snowden revelations had been really good for business. So you had people who were trying to sell to, um, yes, law enforcement in democratic countries, but you know also law enforcement and governments in countries like Bahrain uh, that are repressive. And these vendors are appealing to them, saying, you are seriously behind the eight ball. You know, every other country on the planet looked at the NSA and said, I'd like a bit of that as well. And she said there was actually a, a Chinese company that was um, saying, describing its product as um, NSA in a box. So. It's another perspective. And can, can I just add a, a, a couple of points? Um, you know, my, my read of, of the Snowden revelations is not actually that when, with regard to the law and the application, interpretation of the law by the intelligence community, it was not that we, we see an intelligence community run amok. Uh, uh, actually, I think we, sh we see an intelligence community that is interpreting its legal authorities very aggressively because we have asked them to and repeatedly reaffirmed through the political process that that is what we are expecting, indeed demanding, of the intelligence community. And so they have been interpreting their, their legal authorities quite uh, uh, aggressively. Uh, but upon, upon uh, interpreting them that way, the intelligence community uh, uh, and agencies are also shown to be um, fastidious, meticulous about compliance with the law. Um, and, and, and I think that comes out in the, in the documents themselves. Uh, so for me, the, the, the next point I'd make is, I, you know, I think what the, 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 the Snowden revelations uh, bring, bring out is, 
in, in part a debate about law, but it's really about policy trade-offs. Um, and partly that's a trade-off between um, security and liberty or, or surveillance and privacy, though I think that sort of binary, uh, 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 binary characterization of the trade-off is, is way too simple, in part because there is not always a trade-off between them, but in part also, and this gets to some of the points that Yasmin uh, uh, was making, security is itself a broad concept. Security is, is in part about our physical security and preventing terrorist attacks, but uh, 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 technological innovation in the private sector is a big component of national security uh, 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 as well. And so I think we need to think about, we, we need to think hard about trade-offs, not just between values, but also between uh, uh, different elements of, of, of security. When I, when I look, though, at, at where this, uh, national debate and international debate is going in the sort of post-Snowden revelation world. Um, uh, it doesn't seem to me that we're landing at a place, at least in, at, at the policy level, that is radically different from where we were before. I think we are seeing more actions in the private sector and Yasmin uh, uh, talked about some of those. Um, but uh, uh, when it comes to uh, government decision making about whether we are going to take offline intelligence programs that were put online, uh, I, I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see big changes on the horizon. And, and again, I think that's because the political process is speaking and affirming them. Thank you. Can I, Shane, can I ask you a follow-up question and then I'm gonna ask another question from here? The president appoint, appointed a review panel. It included Richard Clark, Cass Sunstein, Peter Swire, people who at the time he appointed them, there was criticism saying, oh, well, they're gonna be in the tank. Mm -hmm. You know, Cass, you know, was a presidential appointee. Peter was a presidential appointee. Richard Clark, you know, was a known commodity. So they go through this review process. They're three very thoughtful people, they produce a presidential review as a response to this Snowden uh, report. It's A1 above the fold news when it does. We haven't heard anything about it since, and you said you don't expect him to enact any of the review recommendations. Can you remind people here first what some of the key find not all of them, but what some of the key findings from the review were, one, and two, why isn't Barack Obama going to, in your opinion, enact any of the recommendations from his self-appointed review panel? Um, so among the key ones were, <clears throat> and I think there were something like 37. I mean, there yeah. were a lot. I'm not asking for all 37. Yeah, yeah no, we don't have time for that. I, couldn't, <laughs> I don't remember all 37, trust me. Um, there were some, some high-level ones were about the restriction of the collection of metadata. Um, you know, that, that program may expire on its own by June. I kind of doubt it. I think, you know, we talked about this earlier today. They'll probably find an 11th hour solution to it, although you wouldn't know it by the inactivity in Congress right now. Um, and there were some others that kind of, you know, were a little bit more in the weeds and didn't get as much coverage, but were really important. So, for instance, there was a recommendation that the National Security Agency, which right now has a, has a, has a dual mission of both helping to defend computer networks in the United States, but also conducting offensive operations on computer networks, should basically not do both of those jobs, that you should separate that out, um, that the head of the NSA should not also be the head of Cyber Command, as he is right now, because that was viewed as a conflict of interests and too much power, um, that the National Security Agency should stop the collection of what's called uh, zero-day vulnerabilities, which are flaws in software that would allow an attacker to get privileged access into a system that are basically the tools of cyber weapons. Basically saying NSA should disclose those vulnerabilities when it finds them, not hoards them. Um, all of these would have radically changed the way that we do surveillance, the way we conduct so offensive cyber operations. I think the reason that the president ultimately took none of them is because I think this president is extremely comfortable with aggressive executive power when it comes to surveillance and when it comes to cyber warfare. Um, one of the two programs that George W. Bush told Barack Obama to keep before he was inaugurated was the uh, program to uh, conduct computer uh, uh, offensive operations against the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran. The other one was the targeted killing through drones program. Obama kept both of those and accelerated both of those. He, I think, has always been of the view that while he doesn't necessarily have a really warm, fuzzy relationship with the intelligence community, 
and there's some distance and some friction there, I do think he's very comfortable with the job that they do and he wants those authorities. Uh, had he implemented some of these more aggressive kind of, you know, really disruptive changes that his own, in fact, panel was recommending, I think he would have caught hell for it from the Republicans in Congress. And I think that fundamentally he thought that was just going too far and that, that, that even what Snowden revealed did not, in his mind, I think, show an intelligence community run amok. I think he's extremely comfortable with it and believes that there is rigid compliance within that culture, which, by the way, I think there is. You may not like where the lines of the law are drawn, but by and large, the agency is staying within those lines. And what intelligence professionals will tell you is it's not our job to draw the line. You tell us where to go and we will perform the job within them. That's Congress's job and the president to draw the lines and they're not changing them. Thank you. Let me remind everybody if you have questions, write them down on the card, hold it up and Kate will come get them. Let me also remind you that we are also taking questions on Twitter through the hashtag future war SIPA. So future war S-I-P-A. Uh, on to the next question, and, and Professor Wallach, this has your name all over it. Uh, it says, can we talk a bit about the future of war and technology outside of cyberspace? And there are three bullets below this. First bullet is space space, the vulnerability of space-based communications platforms. Second one is something I know you think a lot about, 3D printing. Non-state actors have greater access to, exa to exotic and hard to detect weapons through 3D printing. Uh, I, I come from West Virginia where we have 1.7 million people and 2.1 million guns. And the idea that we are now able to print guns in my home state is remarkable. Uh, and the third bullet is the post-Westphalian order and warfare between corporations and networks, not just cyber war, but also actual war. So <clears throat> I'll take the third one first because uh, I'm kind of obsessed right now with the post-Westphalian order, as, as, as you know. As one is. As one is. Um, I, I think about it a lot. Because um, look, the, the nation state is only a couple hundred years old, right? It was kind of a, it was a great way of closing down the hundred years war, uh, not to be too you know, macro about it. Um, and, it and it's worked pretty darn well for a couple hundred years, um, I think in many different ways. The, but as Matt, as Matt will you know, tell us, that so much of our both obviously domestic law, which is defined by those borders, but also international law, again, is defined by a relatively new vehicle or, or platform, if you will, called the nation state. And so what I, what I struggle with, and I think what we're all struggling with is, and, and this goes to the, to the second bullet point, is, yeah, 3D printing, but I, you know, I'm as concerned now um, by the rogue individual who has a master's in microbiology as I am about Fordo. Um, and in some ways, I'm actually less concerned about, this is going to get me a lot of emails, I'm less concerned about Fordo uh, or the, the, the water enrichment plant as I am about this disaffected youth who got their master's at some university, either abroad or here, who now has the power uh, to take out, if not hundreds of thousands of people via weaponized anthrax or weaponized a lot of things. Um, so I think the, three, the 3D printing is still kind of in the, in the physical realm because yes, you can now 3D print a plastic gun that you can get past all sorts of different security barriers, but it's, it's the rise, and this is you know, the future of war and armed conflict, the, the very idea of arms, right? Because the arms that we've been talking about are, the, are zeros and ones, but at the viral or, or microbiological, Nation states have kind of, and in some, I mean, obviously, different moments for the past century, this has kind of ebbed and flowed, and there's been acute situations. But I kind of feel like since World War I, we kind of, we, we got together and we realized some of this stuff is just really bad, and, we, and it was developed, but it was never really used until actually recently in the Middle East. Um, and so, without this kind of Westphalian order to kind of keep everyone in check, I think that's when things start to break down very, very quickly. I, I can tell Matt's going to yeah. jump right. And, the, and, the, and, the, and the, by the way, this applies to space as well. So my understanding, and this is also going to go right, right to you, is what we have in terms of space is really like kind of the law of the sea, right? That's the closest thing we have to space law in, in a certain sense and how you can kind of weaponize it. My hope was that space would always be from a legal framework much like Antarctica, right? It would be this thing that was there that everyone kind of agreed not to occupy. 
Um, but I think that has long gone. But I'll let you address this kind of Westphalian. No, I, I mean, I was going to agree with, the, with, with, with some of what you said, and, and I, I have to commend to the, to the audience, in addition to getting Shane's uh, recent book, At War, I also recommend a book called The Future of Violence by um, uh, my friends uh, Ben Wittes at the Brookings Institution and Gabby Bloom uh, from, from Harvard Law School. Uh, they argue in this recent book uh, something similar. They argue that the tools of violence, the instruments of violence, are getting cheaper and cheaper and more dispersed, and that this is really, in addition to posing some security risks, it's really fundamentally challenging the ability of states to provide for our basic security. It's undermining this basic deal between the sort of social contract between the individual and the, and, and the state uh, that, uh, that uh, I, I, because technologies of violence, the technologies that can do us harm are becoming cheaper and cheaper and more dispersed. Uh, this makes us more and more vulnerable to other private individuals and also makes us more dependent on them. We're more, more and more dependent on the private sector for our security. So cybersecurity is something Ari was talking about earlier, right? We don't really look to the government to provide our cybersecurity. We look to private firms to provide for our cybersecurity. We look to our own uh, good uh, 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 sort of online hygiene to, uh, to protect our, 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 our cybersecurity in a lot of important ways. We also look to the state for certain things um, but in certain aspects of cybersecurity, but a lot of it we turn to the private sector to, uh, I, 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 we look to the private sector uh, I, I, to provide. Uh, you know, in terms of w making predictions, I, I began here tonight by saying I'm, I'm cautious about making bold predictions. I, I have a couple of dire ones. One is um, I, I really, really do worry in the coming decades about the, uh, the implications of cheaper and cheaper, more accessible synthetic biological products of the kind that, uh, that Ari is talking about. So I really worry about um, a, a real crisis and, and uh, very, very scary incidents that can arise when those kinds of technologies are misused. So one prediction is, um, is that we're going to see those kinds of really, really scary incidents. It's hard for me to describe because it's a bit unpredictable what exactly it would look like. But my other prediction is that after, in the wake of these incidents, we're going to be looking at the government and saying, why weren't you keeping more tabs on uh, who was doing what with some of these technologies? And one of the things in the wake of these kinds of crises and the re the, in the wake of these uh, of, 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 of attacks is going to be a look back and saying, why wasn't our intelligence more aggressive in dealing with some of these futuristic threats? Uh, you remind me of something that James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, likes to say, which that you know, in the, in, in the world, there, there are two things. There are policy, policy successes and intelligence failures, right? And every time there's something bad happens, it's the question of what is the intelligence failure. <clears throat> um, I'll make a case, and I'll use Clapper's words, too, for um, why you should be really scared about space and threats in space. Um, he loves in speeches, he'll, he'll be talking about cybersecurity, he'll be talking about China. He always makes this plug for the space-based threats that we're facing largely from China and its anti-satellite capabilities. I think he once called them fearsome and impressive. And what we're talking about here is, you know, building satellites or building ground-based weapons that go into space that can disrupt our satellites, uh, crash them, knock them out of orbit, et cetera, try to disrupt them. Um, I think this is a whole other area that, you know, I'm certainly fascinated by as a reporter that doesn't get a lot of press, but it's something that is in that category of causing sleepless nights in the intelligence community. Um, and, and also, you know, on, the, on our sort of side of it, the kinds of things that we're looking for, and Clapper talks a lot about this as well, are persistent surveillance. So more spy satellites that can hover over one area and stay there for a long time, high altitude drones that can orbit for hours and hours on end without having to refuel. I mean, we see our adversaries, though, going in that very same direction with this technology. I mean, when we talk about things like anti-satellite capabilities, drone technology, cyber, one of the things that's really remarkable that ties them all together is that the barrier to entry for some of this stuff is pretty low. It's certainly not as high as it is for nuclear weapons, where the really exquisite knowledge for that is actually something that has not widely proliferated around the globe. And we know how to track that stuff pretty well. It's very specific knowledge and stuff that you're looking for, and we know how to find that. But all of these technologies, what unites them in cyber is probably the, the easiest to accomplish, I think, is that they are actually 
quite simple relatively for nation states to acquire and increasingly for individuals to acquire. And I'll, I'll plug Ben and Gabby's book, Future of Violence, on that as well, where they say that we're entering a world of many-to-many -many threats where potentially every person on the planet becomes a threat vector and is capable of disrupting national security in a way that previously we would have only thought governments or you know, small armies were capable of doing. We're making sure that everybody has difficulty sleeping tonight. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is a question that came in uh, through Twitter. And Yaz, if I could ask you to, to be at least one person to respond to this. The question is, what is the strategic significance of major technology and social media companies and their infrastructure being US-based? What does it mean that the companies are in the US and what does it mean that, you're, that you keep uh, most of your data centers in the US? Well, we uh, don't keep all of our data centers in the US, and it's kind of interesting. We don't keep all of the data that we have about users in the US in our US data centers. So part of the way that um, we make sure that we're most efficiently using our data centers and also making sure that we don't lose anybody's data is by having several uh, copies of everyone's data I in, uh, in different places around the world. So, so. Um, it's not the case that we, because we're an American company, we only have servers in America. Um, we also have offices, so kind of presence in 47 countries around the world. Um, and, I, and I'm pretty confident that most of our revenue comes from outside of the US. So um, in many ways, I don't see ourselves, we are a US company and a lot of our values um, are associated with US values, but I, I kind of don't see, I think a lot of Google employees don't necessarily um, see us as uh, a U.S. company in terms of um, anything that would be a threat to, uh, to our users. I think that there are um, a bunch of things that we're doing to protect our data and our users against um, infringements from any unauthorized uh, access, including from the U.S. government. So um, I feel pretty confident about saying that even though we're a U.S. company, it doesn't mean that our users' data is being shared in, um, in a bulk way with the U.S. government. Um, if, that's, if that's kind of like the underlying concern behind the question. Let, let me pull sort of one string, uh, pull on one string from your remarks, and that is, you know, for a lot of people around the world, there's a, con there's a concern that for, for the 20 year period from 1994 to 2014, basically the rise of the consumer internet, the power was overwhelmingly concentrated in an area that was 30 miles long and 15 miles wide, you know, from San Francisco to San Jose. As we become uh, a world of three billion connected people, which will someday, become, someday soon become six billion people, the economic value that inures to that connectedness, a lot of it inures to, again, a very small uh, geographic area. A thesis of mine, I have a book coming out in the fall called uh, The Industries of the Future, is that in the industries of the future, some of which have been in discussion here, but some of which haven't, such as the commercialization of genomics and other such things, domain experience, deep, ex deep knowledge uh, about a specific industry is gonna be much more globally distributed than it has been in the computer sciences. So if you go to Silicon Valley, um, it's not that there are a lot of really smart people from Northern California uh, who are starting technology companies and who are, and who, um, who are building large technology companies. A lot of the campuses of these technology companies look like the United Nations. You know, people are, are coming from all over the world. Um, you know, oftentimes the company founders are immigrants or children of immigrants. 40% of the Fortune 500 uh, are the children or children, are, are, the, are immigrants or the children of immigrants? And that's been borne out um, in Silicon Valley. But what I do believe is that when you look at the industries of the future, there's gonna be much more geographic spread. So sort of the after, you know, what's after the internet, whether it is artificial intelligence or robo and robotics, whether it is big data, whether it is genomics or other such things, I do think that this concern about Silicon Valley always owning and dominating the, the platforms is gonna be less applicable to uh, the so-called industries of the future. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, so if you have uh, any last questions, again, please hold them up, and uh, Kate will come, we'll, we'll get to them. Alec, I'm gonna ask you a question. All right. uh, so, 
you may or may not agree with the thesis, but agree with it for a second. In this, going, I'm pulling a string off of what yeah. you just said. It, as we move into this kind of post-Westphalian moment, right? So where these campuses have students from around the world, and but uh, as we move where, where certain individuals are having less and less of a, almost a connection to that nation-state identity. And I know in a lot of parts of the world it's actually increasing, but I would argue that's actually a reaction to the underlying disruption that digital is causing in, in economies. But as we see people kind of disconnected, and I know this because even in some of our students, it's like, it's kind of like, and this sounds cliche, but it's almost like Generation Facebook. Like they're not necessarily from a country. They work everywhere. They happen to have a passport. But now like uh, what a student said to me is like, look, my iPhone now has a GSM chip. It works in 110 different countries. Like that's where I belong. That's where I am. I know that's an early outlier in 2015, but as we move into this, more and more into what I think more and more individuals who are disconnected from that nation state for, for various reasons, um, does the nation state start to lose legitimacy as the actor and driver of conflict? So in that, and this is actually in many ways to everyone. So in other words, right now for Google or for Sony, let's say to go on the offensive, it seems like no way because that's the role of the country. But as these things kind of emerge where people are less connected from that nation state, are we going to be expecting, you know, I, I, in other words, if my iPhone is, is hacked, do I want NSA or do I want Apple to go after them as I become more connected to that? As someone coming from the State Department, the, like, anchor of Westphalian connections. That's right. We love our 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. Um, it, well, I agree with the part of your thesis insofar as it relates to elites, Okay. So those individuals in those institutions that consider themselves global and identify themselves as global um, tend to be elite. So a corporation that, in, that goes through an inversion, that changes its headquarters from being in the United States to being in Ireland because of favorable tax treatment in Ireland, or uh, a corporation that you know, gets mad at its headquarters country because you know it's treating its profits in the other 195 countries differently than it's treating the countries made at home. I, I think that that tends to be segmented among elites. And I think that among elites, the virtue and value of the nation state as authority has diminished, especially in the face of what is oftentimes perceived to be inefficient governance. So if you go to Davos, which you know it has its strengths and its weaknesses, but it is sort of ground zero for, you know, the super state global citizen elites, right? They are constantly talking about and building programs that are, in effect, workarounds, the shortcomings that they see as being rooted in uh, the, structure, the structures and strictures of 196 sovereign nation states. And the thing is, though, that among the 7.2 billion people on planet Earth, there are probably 5 million individuals who think and identify that way. I think that this will change. I could be wrong about this. I think that this will change as demographics shift. Um, but it matters much more economically than as a matter of national security. That's what I believe on that. Can I, can I come in just yeah. from, from um, the perspective of the user of internet services? I, just, I don't think they necessarily care too much um, where the company that is giving them their service um, is headquartered or where the product idea was born. So when you um, think about free expression platforms like Facebook and YouTube and, and uh, Twitter, they, they certainly weren't designed with civil uprisings in mind, um, but that doesn't stop uh, protesters in uh, Ukraine using them to organize their protests or to um, or to document them and, and tell the world about them afterwards. There's a, there's a slightly less well-known um, tech example, which is good to share, uh, which is a, a mobile messaging app by a group called Open Garden, uh, which is called FireChat. And FireChat was designed um, in the US with people who go to festivals in mind, festivals like Burning Man, so to your point about elites. Um, and at Burning Man, there's as many festivals as it's off the grid. There's no way to communicate with each other. There's no cell reception. So they designed this kind of offline mobile messaging app that allows people to communicate with each other using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. They didn't think that it was going to be used by um, 
the protesters on the streets in, in Hong Kong's Umbrella Revolution. But in the first 10 days of that uprising or demonstration, uh, uh, the app had been downloaded half a million times in, in, in an island of 7 million people, which is pretty tremendous. Um, former Russian opposition leader Boris Yemtsov asked his supporters to download FireChat um, in case the Russian government decided to clamp down on communications. On the first day he did so, 25,000 people downloaded that app. He continued to use it uh, throughout and even in, in the moment that he was arrested. Um, so I think from the perspective of the user, they really don't care where the country headquarters of the company is or what the product concept was when these technologies were conceived. They just care that it can help them communicate with each other um, when they're otherwise facing uh, repression on online and offline. Thank you. I'm gonna, we have 10 minutes left and a lot of questions. Uh, Matt, I'd love to hear your response to this, but obviously anybody else who'd like to weigh in as well. Geopolitically, would you consider cyberspace a nu as neutral or as promoting Western interests? Um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it, it seems that cyberspace has, has really been harnessed um, for uh, uh, a variety of different kinds of regimes in order to effectuate their policy. It has been used by Western democracies in order to try to spread freedoms. Uh, and it has also been used by individuals or movements within repressive countries in order to try to achieve them. Uh, but it's also proven to be a very useful tool for autocratic regimes to maintain control. Um, I, you know, I think when you look back at you know de debates and discussions, uh, it, especially in the 1990s, um, about what would you know, first it was globalization of the economy, and then especially uh, 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 the sort of cyber boom, the internet boom. Um, there were a lot of optimistic predictions. Um, that it would be impossible for autocratic regimes to maintain control of information, to uh, uh, continue to repress dissent, uh, 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 prevent the uh, uh, spread of, 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 of certain ideas that a regime was opposed to, et cetera. Uh, I've been quite amazed over the 20 years since then um, at how skilled many repressive regimes have been at maintaining control over over those that sort of information environment. Now, Yasmin and 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 you and others have talked about tools that are making are are, are exposing cracks, uh, exploiting cracks, driving wedges through that. Um, uh, but I, 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 it's I, I think the reality is this information technology has uh, has been used by both sides uh, in a grand debate about what the future of the state and society ought to look like uh, and it's uh, you know a lot of the a, a lot of the there's been a bit of an arms race between uh, the tools of democracy and the tools of repression in cyberspace you know the one thing that I will say about this is, you know, the points that you make are all correct. You know, I think the technologies themselves are value neutral. They take on the values and intentions of the users who animate the technology. But I will say, I will say this. I believe that the principal political binary of the 20th century was left versus right. And the principal political binary of the 21st century is open versus closed. And I do believe that this connectedness helps open things up. And even in politically closed environments like China, I do believe that the internet has helped open that country up economically. And I also believe, for example, in a more politically closed environment like Egypt, you know, I, having been witness to the State Department, you know, as a member of the State Department, the State Department bureaucracy's misdiagnosis of uh, the sentiment of the street in Egypt. One of the things that so surprised people was just how unpopular Mubarak was. And so I think a lot of the time, you know, I could be wrong. This is me being hopeful. This is me being sort of the, you know, optimistic American. 
I do believe that a lot of the time, I think that the governments might not be controlling the information environment, but they're controlling state security. Um, and so in Egypt, I think that Mubarak maybe didn't control the information envi environment, but he absolutely controlled the state security apparatus, so there was no visible evidence that he wasn't controlling the information environment. It's a thought. It's probably a naive thought. The, the one thing I just want to, uh, just to add on to that very quickly, is to me it's not, the internet is not so much, and this goes back to the, to the war theme, it's not so much about the content, but the actual structure of itself and what that represents. So the idea of a decentralized, multi-nodal network and what that does to people's ideas of how power moves and how it, and, and so yes, and then it becomes the content and the tools that are on it. But I think once people are kind of even exposed to that very idea, which by the way, I think is also post-Western, and I could actually argue in some ways it's actually very Eastern if you go back uh, maybe about a thousand years, I, I think that is actually the greatest benefit of what, what the internet has done. It's just even the very way that it's structured, and that that's a possibility. Just forgetting the, the content for a second. Just uh, to reiterate Alex's point about uh, technology being used for good and ill, uh, depending on, on uh, the user. And overall, obviously, as an individual and as a company, we're really bullish on technology being good for um, democracy and, and um, people's welfare economically and otherwise. Um, we haven't spoken about it, but of course, the Islamic State um, is using technology uh, uh, not to pursue, um, not to kind of uh, progress Western values at all. Uh, one of the most alarming uh, uh, aspects of the Islamic State has been their, their uh, success at recruiting. Um, the foreign fighter phenomenon in, in Syria and Iraq um, has seen more than 18,000 people leave their homes outside of the region to go and fight with ISIS and other rebel groups there. Um, and they're using the internet to, to help them. Uh, uh, as it happens, the social media platforms, YouTube being one of them, um, target the same demographic that they're going for, which is the 18 to 34 year old group. Uh, they, social media helps amplify uh, voices, including unfortunately extrem extremist ones. Um, and while the underlying, underlying kind of dynamics and values around radicalization and, and political Islam are the same as they were before the advent of the internet, the internet is helping them uh, by lowering boundaries, uh, barriers to um, accessing people with uh, uh, a similar philosophy and, and political outlook, and also uh, lowering boundaries for people who are, sorry, lowering barriers for people who are trying to find out how they can practically go about jihad. Um, because of the internet, it's much easier to find out uh, where you can cheaply buy a ticket to go to Turkey or where you should cross the border into Syria and where you can find an AK-47, um, etc. And I was, last time I was in um, Brussels working on, on this uh, issue of radicalization with the European um, Commission, I heard of a story of two high school boys who um, were using the internet to plan a two-week jihad um, to correspond with their high school um, midterm break. So there's a, well, I was going to say, have, how many people here have seen ISIS's online magazine, Dabiq, the English language version? Like, it, it's unbelievable, right? So I was reading it a couple of days ago. So for those who don't know, it's, it's a very professional, glossy magazine that's put out in PDF format, and you, you can find it online. Um, and so when I think, and we were talking about this a little bit before the panel, and I'm going to let everyone kind of comment on this, the, the future of war now, there's this idea of soft war and hard war, right? There's like kinetics, where we spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on an F-35 program, but then we also have someone who just has amazing Photoshop skills, mm -hmm. right? And who's able on like their MacBook Pro that they bought somewhere to put together something like Dabiq and start, and then, and then start recruiting, and it's kind of this internal propaganda recruiting mechanism that is part of this extended information war. So it may not be you know, at, at Stuxnet level, but we're seeing more and more kind of this idea of ideology, ideological warfare that's kind of like soft, you know, that's like, that's like the new shock and awe, right? One ISIS video is the equivalent 20 years ago in some ways of what we try to do with it, like almost several hundred tomahawks, right? It was the same kind of idea. They're doing it um, in that way. So I guess, you know, to Alec, for kind of what you're seeing, how does, I know you're not at the State Department now, but like, how should we be thinking about countering narratives when, they're, when the media of warfare of non-country actors is becoming so powerful? That's, look, that's the, 
billion dollar question right now. I mean, the, the kind of communications we could do during the Cold War, you know, during the struggle between capitalism and communism, it was, it was in many respects much more polite. You know, it was advocacy for democracy, advocacy for an economic system that we believed that we could argue, you know, without obfuscation, without Photoshop, you know, just, we were gonna win the argument if we got a chance to make the argument. In this case where religion is at the core of this, and we can't forget, you know, an interpretation of religion being such an important part of this, I think we need to fight much dirtier and much harder in the information war. And the way our, our, our government is constituted right now, uh, at least in the overt, in the white and gray world right now, is it's exceedingly risk averse. Um, and if you make a mistake in an information operation, you are gonna be lampooned and fired very quickly. But as a very practical matter, these guys at ISIS probably tried 14 different things before like the magazine took off, right? This is why people ask why Russia has become such a spectacularly effective internet propagandist. It's because they're doing anything. And if something fails, it's no big deal. They, they kill it off. But if something works, then it is supported. There's, there is no, nothing like that open playing field uh, in, on the overt side of the United States government allowing for counter messaging, sort of information operations. You know, when you color outside the line a little bit, it ends up in the Washington Post, people get slapped on the hands, and you know, a bunch of bedwetting bureaucrats end up doing absolutely nothing to dial back uh, ISIS. Um, so until there is a sort of get caught trying mentality to countering narratives coming from violent extremists like like those in ISIS, but also equally applicable to the conflict in U Ukraine where we are in you know, a, a real information competition with Putin's Russia. You know, it's like bringing a knife to a gunfight. You're not gonna win, right? So in each of these, the United States is using, is, even though we are bigger, stronger, and richer, we are not willing to go as far as our adversaries are, and therefore are less wealthy, less powerful, smaller adversary kills us because they, they brought the gun and we brought the knife. And so I think we need to fight harder, we need to fight meaner, and we need to get into these fights to win in the information operation space in the same way in which we do kinetically. If we're gonna bomb ISIS, then we need to bring the same resolve to our information operations there. Um, I think it's important to remember that ISIS is not inventing anything, it's just innovating. And in many ways it's repeating. Um, the magazine that came first was Inspire. It was Al Qaeda's magazine. Um, the beheading videos first started appearing in 2006 online with people like Nick Berg, who was a State Department contractor who was killed, or Danny Pearl, even before that, who was killed by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. So ISIS, in many ways, is just doing what its predecessor organization did, but a lot more effectively, a lot more slickly, and with a much savvier sense of, frankly, its sort of millennial audience and how to engage with it. They would be, their skills would be actually really well used in a newsroom, frankly. Um, and there are people who are trying to hire people who know how to do this stuff. We did have a strategy in 2006 and in 2007 and 2008 to deal with Al Qaeda in Iraq, which was using this propaganda, and the strategy was we killed them. What we do not have right now in Syria and in Iraq are the boots on the ground that principally through the surge and some of our counter information operations that we did in Iraq uh, were used to go find the people that were propagating this stuff and take them out. That was the strategy to defeat Al Qaeda's propaganda sort of organ. And the NSA very carefully monitored websites that were showing beheading videos and used them to find out where the people were who were posting them and then went and shut those people down in addition to shutting the websites down. So we do have an analog and an example for how we have dealt with this before. Obviously it came back to haunt us and it came back much stronger. Um, but I'm, I'm not really optimistic that any sort of counter-programming on the social media front is gonna work. Many of the same reasons that Alec just said. It looks like hearts and minds and it looks, like, it looks foolish and we, you know, we're a bureaucracy and they're a network. Um, we're not going to put boots on the ground. And so I think we're really left with very few options for how to counter this stuff, at least based on recent experience. We're going to have to come up with something that we have not tried before. 
why don't we, we are, we are now out of time, but what I would love to do is if we could wrap up uh, with each person closing with sort of one thought. If there's one last thing you would want to say, you know, based on, and thank you all, these are, these were tremendously thoughtful questions. Um, and this has been a very enjoyable discussion from my perspective. Uh, if we could conclude, if there's one final thought uh, that you would like to share, starting with Professor Waxman uh, for the audience. Um, uh, sure, I mean, I, I, I do think um, uh, the, the, the last question reveals um, technology is, is shaping warfare in ways that are not, that, that's not progressing linearly, right? Um, I, I, and this is partly what I was referring to at the, at the, very, at the very beginning, um, that uh, I, I, I changes, development of, of uh, cyber technologies, uh, robotics, other things that we've talked about will, on the one hand, uh, uh, empower uh, large military strong states to be even stronger um, and to wage war against each other in uh, in new ways but it'll also uh, empower entirely new actors and and new new forms of, 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 of conflict in some ways uh, uh, allowing them to uh, uh, wage violence in ways that uh, are, are not at all technologically sophisticated, right? I mean, the, the thing about ISIS is, or a thing about it, is that it is using social media information technology in some very sophisticated ways to recruit, um, but then uh, uh, committing the actual violence, murder, um, in very, very, very basic ways, not high tech at all. Uh, um. I suppose my closing thought is to reiterate, uh, reiterate that there really is a, a cyber spillover to every real world event, um, whether it's uh, denial of service attacks that uh, are waged against pro-democracy websites um, in Ukraine that come alongside um, crackdowns in the street, or whether it's uh, the Syrian electronic army doing hacking to reinforce intelligence gathering on behalf of Bashar al-Assad. There is and there will increasingly be um, the cyber dimension to the things that we're seeing unfold in, in the physical world. Um, and from the perspective of Google Ideas, this really is a plea for, for um, technologists and uh, policy experts and NGOs to really come together um, to, to figure out how we really protect and empower um, today's three billion, but also uh, the next three billion people coming online in the next decade. My, my, final, my final thought is twofold. One that I hope in the future, I'm not going to say in the near future, but in the medium term for future, pa panels like this just don't exist, right? Like, even, you know, some of my, as you said, le you know, left, left, some of my lefty friends are like, A, why are you on this panel? And B, aren't you even perpetuating the very idea and giving legitimacy to violent conflict by being on something like this? Um, yes, somewhat, but I don't want to be Pollyannish. And I know there's some really bad people in the world who want to do really bad things. So we have to, we have to confront this. My... My concern, though, in the, again, but also in the medium term, um, and to Shane's point about boots on the ground, I, I fear that we're moving away from a point of boots on the ground and we'll be moving to one of kind of titanium boots on the ground. So as we start to see, um, and this goes in the area both of, of drones and robotics and cybernetic systems that are somewhat self-aware and, and have, you know, right now a drone, uh, a predator still has someone on the trigger in a, basically in a, you know, in a trailer in Nevada who still pulls the trigger, right? But we're moving to a point where the, the computational power um, on board of the platform doesn't require that. Um, and I, I fear that we're gonna be going into a slippery slope both in the sky and on the ground. And what, what, what'll happen is warfare and the, the, the future of armed conflict is gonna get easier uh, for a lot of powers. And so my concern is, not that I like to, look, <clears throat> when I see pictures of Walter Reed Hospital from Afghanistan and Iraq, it's terrible. But I think sometimes seeing those pictures kind of widens the general public to what the ramifications of the failure of politics looks like when you go to, to violent and armed conflict. And my concern is that as we start to see in this medium term a reduction of that, which is great in and of itself of, of people coming back with arms and legs missing, because we've in many ways outsourced this to robotics and other basically silicon and titanium, that we may be 
prone, those in, on the Hill and other places, to move into armed conflict more easily. Um, so that, that's both my note and my kind of big concern to keep us up at night. Start drinking now <laughs> and often. Um, I, I, um, uh, I guess the, the big sort of, it's not a prediction, but sort of where I see <clears throat> the large trends going, maybe it's a prediction, is again that, the, that the, the cheapness and the relative ease of acquisition of potentially very dangerous and actually very dangerous technologies to more and more people and traditionally not the kinds of people you'd be able to expect to exert that kind of force, that's gonna come to define the nature of conflict. And just speaking you know, as an American, what I really worry about is that we lose restraint and that we allow our response to this proliferation of threats to drive choices and policies that start to erode the foundations of an open and liberal society in which we live. That is always, to my mind, been the much greater existential threat than Al-Qaeda or ISIS or Cyber Armageddon or take your pick. Um, there is a hopeful note in all of this. I mean, there, there is an argument that has been made, for instance, with drones that, believe it or not, what if drones are actually a humanitarian technology? What if what the drone allows you to do as it gets more and more precise is target this precise individual who you mean to kill in war and in combat and to avoid massive collateral damage and civilian casualties. That is an argument, and as the technology gets more precise, we will face a reality in which we can go out and kill one person or a group of people and have near certainty that we are not going to kill a lot of other civilians. I would hope that as the United States, in particular in the military, is embracing this technology, that it keeps that idea of restraint and proportionality and, and the values that have been guiding us in mind. Um, look to science fiction. You know, if we had RoboCop and Terminator, we could put boots on the ground right now in Syria and take care of ISIS. We can look for ways to use technology to save life uh, and, and not to jeopardize it. Well, I'd like to conclude by thanking everybody for choosing to spend some of their Thursday uh, talking about the future of war. Um, I, I specifically want to rethank our event sponsors and two individuals in particular, Ingrid Gerstmann and Kate Overdahl. Thank you so much for, for uh, making this a success. Uh, there, there is some food and wine remaining. Uh, and again, thank you so much. <laughs>